Hi guys. In this last video that I'm recording for this class, woohoo, we are going to cover exploratory factor analysis. I'm also going to talk a little bit about PCA as a comparison point, um, but we're only going to focus on EFA. <clears throat> kind of going to switch between a couple windows here because I have slides for this one, but also we'll work in some uh, Excel and a Word document. Now EFA is really a big switch from regular hypothesis testing because it's more about model fitting than hypothesis testing. So um, what we're going to do is kind of outline what some of the terms are here because they're different and then work through an example. So um, when we're talking about measured variables, and this leads into structural equation modeling, uh, those are the real scores from an experiment. Anytime you see somebody talk about a model, you'll get model pictures, kind of like this one. And if you has a square on this model picture, that means it's a real score that someone wrote down in that experiment. So question one here. Those, <coughs> excuse me, those are measured variables. Latent variables are things that that measured variable is supposed to represent. So they're not really measured directly. Um, they're measured indirectly through these items. So anytime you take a questionnaire, generally the questions are your measured variables, but those are trying to get at some latent or um, other bigger phenomenon, and that's what the latent thing is supposed to represent. The easiest way to think about this is IQ. So you can take a Stanford Binet, an IQ test, but those individual items are the measured variables. The latent variable, the thing they're trying to get at is your actual IQ score. And those are generally represented by circles on these diagrams. So these would be questions that they had measured over here and over here. And these would be the uh, things that they're trying to measure using these questions. We're really interested in more of this side of the diagram, trying to see how we can develop scales that measure our latent variables appropriately. So what a factor analysis does is that it, it tries to take a list of items or questions and explain uh, a maximum amount of what's called common variance. So common variance is um, overlapping variance. And we try to do that using the smallest number of factors. The factors are those latent constructs. <clears throat> so we're trying to figure out the way that items go together to measure the smallest number of factors and why the smallest. Well, really it's the smallest because of parsimony. And that's sort of Occam's razor. The simplest solution is the best solution. Um, PCA or principal components tries to explain that total variance rather than just the common variance. Um, and it creates these linear components instead of factors. So EFA creates factors, PCA creates components. And right now that just sounds like semantics, but one of the big differences is that factor analysis is explaining common variance, while principal components analysis explains total variance. So that's one of the big differences between the two. So common variance is the overlapping variance between items. We can think about this as systematic variance or all year we've actually been calling this good variance. Unique variance is variance only related to that item or bad variance. So EFA describes a, the overlapping variance, whereas PCA tries to describe both. And so we can talk about communality, which is the common, the common variance for each individual item. And you can kind of think of that as a squared multiple correlation. And you've heard this term before, that's R squared. So we're trying to explain as much of the question's variance as possible um, by using all the other items to predict that particular item. And we want items to be highly correlated. So in EFA, um, multicollinearity is actually not a problem. Additivity is... Um, you just don't want it to be perfectly correlated or it won't run. So it's kind of like repeated measures. We want things to be correlated. That gives us more power. And that's actually the purpose of an EFA is to find those correlations. And so, um, but again, they can't be perfectly correlated or you'll usually get an error, a, a singular matrix error. So here's just an example of what communality looks like. So variable three here has a communality of one because it is completely subsumed 
by the other two variables, where variable four here has a commonality of zero because it's not related to any of the other items. Variable two here would have a commonality of some number less than one because it's got some error out here that's not accounted for by any other item. So essentially what we try to do here is take a correlation matrix and find the things that are related to each other and squish them into a factor. So here's just an example of these three items are very highly correlated with each other. And so we're gonna take those items and just squish them together. And that's gonna be factor one. And then these three items are very highly correlated with each other and not these other ones. And we'll squish those together. That's, not quite, that's kind of how it works. That's not really what we're gonna do with the analysis, but that's the idea behind it. And then every once in a while you have items like this one here, this interest variable <clears throat> and this talk, well, just the interest variable here. Um, that it doesn't correlate with anything. It correlates kind of over here with these three, but we can't have these big kind of blank spots in a correlation matrix with an item that just doesn't do anything for us. The other big distinction between EFA and PCA that is worth mentioning as reasons why not to do one over the other is the causal direction. We, th we, we, the royal we, <laughs> In EFA, the factors are, ex are expected to cause the answers on the question. So back to IQ. My IQ causes the answers that I get on the Stanford Binet or the WACE. Um, or if you're thinking about personality tests, my personality causes those answers to come out. And that allows us to generalize to other samples. In PCA, the questions are thought to cause the components. So the questions that you asked have caused the pattern of answers that you get. Now it says drawing here, what I mean is about the direction of the arrows. So let me back up just a little bit. Here, the latent variable is causing the question. So the arrow goes from the latent variable to the item here, the direction of the arrow. So X causes Y. That's EFA. PCA is where we think that the questions cause the latent variable. And so I would say that, uh, if I get back to my slide, <clears throat> definitely in psych, EFA is much more common because of the way we conceptualize latent constructs, that we think that the latent construct, the thing we're trying to measure, causes the output that we see in people. Uh, it's the underlying cause. PCA has its, has its proponents where people think whatever you're having them do causes the output that you get. So it's just, it's a... Uh, not completely semantics because there's also mathematical differences between the two, but it's important to understand the theoretical underpinnings that are slightly different as well. And so what is the goal of these? And this is really biased slightly by my research area where I am a scale development person in statistics. And so I use EFA, I don't ever do PCA, as a way to take a set of variables and develop a scale. So I'm approaching it from that angle. There are other uses, but generally people use it to um, understand a set of variables and how they relate to each other. And we can do that to create scales, or we can take very large data sets and reduce them down to smaller sizes of only the relevant correlated information. Um, so we're gonna talk mostly about creating scales here in this example, but there are other uses for both of them. And so generally, uh, and this is from Andy Field's book, but um, what we're trying to do is find clusters of data uh, and group them together. So here's an example of just like, oh, these three go together and these three go together and that's the end. <clears throat> so when we work on our assumptions, which we'll do here in a second, it's got our normal set of data screening rules. And in this particular case, because we're working usually with lots of different items on scales, we can actually impute data. So we'll be able to do something about missing data given you know, the constraints of five, the 5% rule. Um, but with additivity, we really want those items to be correlated, but not uh, perfectly, or it just won't run. Okay. And actually I'm gonna take this out. Um, if variables are not correlated, we'll end up eliminating them but mostly we just want to make sure the items are not perfectly correlated. So they can be correlated at one. Um, I'm gonna do a quick like two more slides and then we'll do data screening. 
So the first one is kind of about power. Um, there's no hard and fast rule for power, except that you cannot use less than 100 people if you're working with people. Okay, if you're trying to do an EFA on states, obviously you can't make up 100 of them. But the general rule is 10 to 15 per item, 10 to 15 participants per item. So if you have 100 items scale, or I'm sorry, whoo, goodness, a 10 item scale, it seems the, about 100 to 150 people would work. Less than 100 people is not acceptable in psychology. Ask me how I know. Mm. <laughs> Things have not gotten published because of it. But one thing that's happened is people have done a lot of what are called Monte Carlos, which are just sort of making up simulated data and testing things. And 300 people has been agreed upon as sort of the golden standard. I've gotten away with less. Um, I think you have to have rather large samples for this stuff to work. Also, we need to make sure our correlations are settled in a sense. So with smaller samples, each individual person has a stronger impact on a correlation. And this data analysis type is all about correlation. So the larger our sample, the less each person has sort of a large impact on the data. And we think, you know, with larger samples, we have more precise measurement as well. Um, but there's no like plug and chug this into G power. It's just as many as possible. And then there's also power on the other end of the number of items. Now this isn't quite power, but I don't really know where to stick it. So it's here. Um, you need at least three to four items per factor um, or component here. And what that means is like three or four items per scale. So if you have 10 um, items or 10 questions, you can really only have two to three factors. And honestly, the more items you have, the better. But with more items, you need more people to accurately measure that. Um, and what that means is that you can't just have one question measuring IQ or one question measuring conscientiousness. You need several questions. And it used to really you had to have three and now I'm seeing more people lean towards four. There are other reasons for that we'll get to at the end of the lecture. But the focus here is on having enough items to accurately measure the latent variable. So not only do we need enough people to accurately measure the items and the correlations, we really need enough items to accurately measure our latent variable. And most people believe that two and less is just not acceptable. Okay, so before we get here, let's go ahead and go through data screening. Um, and if you're opening the Word doc associated with this lecture, it walks through the basically the same lecture, but that this, this version is just sort of written out um, and has a little bit of exp more explanation. So you can also read this document, but we're gonna work through the PowerPoint and do some data screening here. So what we're looking at is a scale with, let's go this way, 32 items. And I have an example of the scale, so we can look at that. And it's about, why did I go to college? So it's got a whole bunch of questions about going to school. Um, and the starred one here, starred ones here are reverse coded. So we're gonna get into dealing with that issue as well. But this just, questions about um, why would I go to school and when you read the questions you can kind of see how you'd expect them to clump together so there are questions about jobs there are questions about intrinsic motivation I feel good when I do this for myself um, there's questions about sort of external motivations um, like money <laughs> but then there's also several reverse coded items so six nine here they're starred and by reverse coded, I mean like most of the questions are positive and these particular items are set, are set as a negative. So 6, 9, 17, and then 27. So that gives us a lot of data to work with here. So let's first save this as an Excel file so we can work on it. And because these, these data sets get rather large and Excel can only handle so much, we're gonna have to kind of coerce it into working here. But let's start by making this our master data set. And then 
work on dealing with um, accuracy issues as well as reverse coding. So let's handle that reverse coding first because it is in a sense an accuracy issue. So the first one here is question six. So I'm just gonna insert, oops, I'm not gonna delete. I'm gonna insert a new column and I'm just gonna title it question six R because that's the one I wanna use. And reverse coding is where everything should be replaced with its opposite. So if I have a one on, a, on the scale, I need to be a seven instead. If it's a two, I need to be a six. Three is a five, four stays four. Now before you get all find and replace happy, it's actually an easier solution. So what you do is um, if the scale starts at one, which most scales are kind of one to seven, it's um, the number of items plus one. So what I can do is say equals, and then eight, so there's seven items, one through seven. So eight minus this item here. And so that creates seven to turn into one. Double click here, six turns into two, one turns into seven, four to four. And so what I did was I just basically took um, the top point plus one, and then I subtracted. And I left them positive. Um, if that confuses you, you can do the find and replace, but it's the number of, it's the highest point plus one uh, minus the point the participant actually scored. Okay. That works for items that are one to seven. If you have like a zero to six, you have to, um, you would end up doing um, six. Like a zero to six would be uh, six minus one because it starts um, at zero instead of at one. Okay. So technically the rule is um, lower the min score plus the max score. Um, but since we're always gonna use one to seven scales for these examples, it's the um, basically plus one at the top. So I'm gonna do that for questions nine. <clears throat> R, there we go. So I'm going to do eight. <laughs> I'm not going to set it equal to eight because then that'll be a problem. Eight minus five here. Okay. Right. 17 and 27. Now, one problem with this double click stuff is that if there's any missing data, it's actually not gonna, it's gonna stop filling in. But we'll find that when we get to the missing data area. So I'll kind of leave that just as a quick reminder that I am double clicking to have it fill the entire column. But if there's any missing data, it's gonna um, actually skip and stop. And so I hit down to see the bottom and I can already see that there's an error here because this scale should only go from one to seven. But we'll cap catch that in a minute because instead of seeing the eight, we'll see the zero. Oops, don't call both of them that. Let's go R here. So this is where we're fixing typos and we fixed our reverse coded items. Um, so you can, in the simplest solution, is to just now take out the other items at some point. Okay. Now, if I just hit delete here, what's gonna happen is everything's gonna turn into eights. So what I find it easiest to do is to copy everything uh, and then paste uh, values. So that um, special coding went away. So I'm just gonna get rid of these columns. Why am I doing that? Well, you don't have to. Um, for me, that just keeps me from screening items that I don't need and creating total scores that include the same item twice. Um, and that's mostly because I'm a squirrel and otherwise I would continue to do stuff with those columns even though I shouldn't. Okay. So we reverse coded everything. Now let's actually look for typos. So I'm gonna click on data data analysis, descriptive statistics. I'm going to highlight everything ever. Labels in the first row, summary statistics. Uh, 
hit OK. Give that a minute because it's probably pretty big. And mainly here I'm concerned about my min and my max. So let's look for problematic numbers here. I know we've already seen one. Maybe there's just the one. There it is. Okay, so this zero here on item 27 is problematic, so we're gonna have to go fix that. Okay, and that's the only one. So I'm gonna come over here, find item 27, and we can click filter. Click on the little down arrow, and since these don't have any decimals, very easy, we just click on that zero, and we're just gonna delete that because it's clearly a typo. That was our eight, and we got, and we, when we converted it from an eight, it converted to a zero. So we fixed our typos. Good job. Oops. Copy all of this, and now let's deal with all the missing data because there's quite a lot. I have 32 items. What that means is that participants can miss how many? Right. So if I have 32 items times 5%, they can actually miss mm, one to two items and me still fill them in. Okay. And so let's calculate the percent complete by person. So I'm gonna divide, I'm gonna use count A, sorry, I got excited. So count A, open parentheses, highlight the whole row, divided by 32 for 32, questions times 100 white plus to black plus double click and then I'm gonna scroll down here to make sure and so see how uh, double clicking here it stopped so what we want to do is make sure that this continues to get filled in so if I realized that, um, okay, stop being weird. <laughs> there we go. Uh, one of my columns that I was correcting the reverse coding for had a lot of missing data. I could go back to my no typos column and make sure I did that correctly. Or my um, master column, since I deleted those columns and just kind of start over at that point. So that's why I keep everything in these tabs is so that I can um, fix any mistakes I make. So I'm gonna sort this by my percent complete column, hit OK. And so I have one person here who has only 68% of their data, and then a couple of columns here where it looks like they're only missing one, one score. Right. So here's my um, reverse coding worked OK. So I have <clears throat> these people I can replace, and I'm going to get rid of this first person because I can't do anything about how much data they're missing. Now I wanna check my columns to make sure that they have the right, less than 5% missing data, because I don't wanna fill in a column if everybody skipped question 12. And so I did, let's just do that again. There are 205 participants. I'm gonna do equals, count A, open parentheses, highlight all my cells, close parentheses, divided by 205, times, oops, wrong button, times 100 to get percent. I'm gonna go to the black plus and drag across here. Ooh, I'm gonna go nuts. God bless Excel. Oh, okay. So now I'm looking here, as I kind of scroll across, all this looks okay. So those one data points that are missing for these five, six people, eight people, um, it's just one data point in those other cells too. So let's replace these people. Now the nice thing about Excel is that if I'm, 
at my cursor here. If you are on Windows, it's Control. If you're on Max, it's Command. And the side arrow, so the left arrow, that'll actually take me to the spot that's missing. So for question 11 here, I need to find the mean. So remember, you highlight the whole column. And for me, I can just look down here, 5.96. And then I think um, on Windows, it's like right here. And then you can, if it says sum, you can like click on sum and change it to average. But either way, you find the average of this column. So 5.96, and you just kind of fill that in. Now that's a decimal, and all the rest of these are not decimals. So let's round it to the nearest whole number to match the rest of the data, which is 6. Now this person's complete. Oh, let's just keep doing that. So question 3 here has two holes in it. So two birds with one stone, so 5.99, which I'm going to round to 6. And then 6 here, too. Question 25 is 6.05, so I'm around down to 6. And I see that spot 6 right there. Question 20 here is 5.90, so pretty common theme that the answer is 6 here. This one's 5.71. So you can use the decimals too. I just, it's more appropriate for the data to be rounded. This one's 4.32, so I'm around down to 4. All right, now I have 100% data, um, and I filled in eight spots that were less than 5% by row and by column. Now, uh, what we want to do is work on our assumptions. So we've got our no miss, I'm sorry, outliers. I was like, whew, forgot where I was going. So let's go no out. Now outliers in an EFA analysis do not, <clears throat> oops. if I have a large number of participants, really don't tend to make a difference. And we can't really, if I, I'm just like all kinds of weird, button clicking right now. So outliers aren't really going to make a huge difference. So you can test it with and without outliers. But I really can't screen 32 z-scores. I mean you can, but you would lose your mind. So we're going to create a total score here. And to create that total score, I'm just going to do sum. Um, or I could create an average score, either way. But I total scores work fine. And I'm going to highlight everything. I'm going to close parentheses. I'm just going to have the total score for each participant. And then from there, I'm going to make a uh, z-score, my total score. So equals, open parentheses, click on that button, minus, click on the whole column. Oh, I'm sorry. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Open parentheses, click here, minus average, open parentheses, click on the whole column, close, close divided by STDEV, open parentheses, click on that whole column again, close. Right, that's what we're doing all year. And then I have a lot of these, so let's color them. So remember, we can highlight the column, do conditional formatting, highlight cell rules greater than 2.99. Conditional formatting, highlight cell rules less than negative 2.99. One popped up already. And since I have a lot of data, I mean, I can scroll through it, I can see there's only one here. Don't forget, you can also use data, filter. You can actually filter by color. So I can get it to show me in my one outlier here. And that is likely because the person just wrote twos and fours. So their score is abnormally low on the scale where everybody else is marking really high scores. So we could take that person out. Although one person honestly won't make too much of a difference. I'll delete them. So we deleted one outlier. Do not double delete. After you delete once, ignore this column because now these z-scores have shifted because I've deleted that person. I'm going to hang on to my total score here. 
I'm going to create my final data set. And then let's work on those assumptions. So I'm going to run my correlation table, but honestly, uh, I mean, we'll do it. But as long as it doesn't go bunk when you try to run it, it'll be fine. So click data analysis, correlations. I hope everyone heard that the dog figured out how to cross the doorway, the blind dog. And he launched himself into the room. <laughs> right, so I've highlighted everything for correlations. I do have labels in that front first row. Hit OK. And really here for additivity, you're looking for... It's also March and the dog is very itchy. <laughs> Aren't we all with the runny noses and the weather and the Bradford pears? And if you have never been around Bradford pears, they really smell. So that aside, what we're looking for here is any ones that are not in the diagonal. So just no perfect correlations. And so you get, I can see these are all like super decimals. And the only time I, I just don't want any ones that aren't on this diagonal line. And um, you just have to be careful here that you don't include, hold on, let me get rid of the dog. <laughs> Come on. Stop. <laughs> ah! Right, I'm totally leaving that in for posterity. You have heard me and the dog. Ugh. So uh, the recent viral meme of the poor um, BBC guy getting interrupted, now it's me and my dog. So anyway, we don't want any ones that are not on the diagonal. What should you be careful of, which is where I was going, is that if you did not delete those reverse non-reverse coded items, they are perfectly correlated with their own reverse coded items. Items. So like question six and question six R are perfectly correlated. So, cause they're the same thing. Um, so be sure you exclude the non-reverse coded items here. And that's why many moons ago I stopped using that item is because we have actually made that mistake where we couldn't figure out why our analysis wouldn't run is because we accidentally left in the reverse coded item and it's it's non-reverse coded friend. So it won't run in that case. Either way, this is looking pretty good. Now what we want to do is try our assumptions because EFA is still a linear, normal, parametric assumptions test. And we're just going to run the assumptions on the total score because running it on 32 columns will not work. So it's not a perfect solution, but that's what we're going to do. So I did equals rand, open close parentheses to create our random number. And we're going to compare everything to our total score. So let us do data analysis, regression. This is a fake regression. My y range here is my random variable. That did not work. My x range here is my total score. I want residuals, standardized residuals, um, residual plots, and normal probability plots. Okay. Wait for a minute and a half while it runs. And then we're going to call this assumptions. going to be sure to hit save since Excel has hated me tonight. Let's create our histogram. So I'm going to create my bins. And do negative two. So I can make this bigger so you can see what I'm doing. Negative 1.5, negative one. This is just an easier way to get a nicer histogram. To create that histogram, I'm gonna click data analysis. Go click on H for histogram. Okay. The input range is my standardized residuals over here. The bin range is those numbers we just created. I don't have any labels. I want the chart. I'm going to tell the chart to just go right there. Oh no! 
Excel. All right. It changed my output range. Uh, my input range when I tried to do that just then. Oh, Excel. <laughs> click here. Click here. Don't think too hard for me, Microsoft Office. <laughs> Not sentient quite yet. There we go. Okay, this looks good. So our input range is all of the standardized residuals. I got my bin range and then stick it right there in the middle. Okay. If you're having too much trouble with that, just stick it in a new tab. So my chart, where did my chart go? Invisible charts, let's try again. Where did the chart go? <laughs> Have I lost my mind? I just don't see the chart anywhere. Okay, fine, just give it to us on a new worksheet so maybe we'll find the chart. There it is. Oh, I'm struggling in this video, guys. All right, so here's our histogram. At least I can laugh at myself. All right, so how does this histogram look? Man, that's the most normal thing ever. So nice, pretty normal histogram. Wish there was some more data over here, but otherwise that looks pretty good. Let's go back and look at the rest of these assumptions. I still have no idea where that picture went. That's fun. Okay, here's our linearity plot. And I've discovered that like, most of these tend to look pretty good. Um, so, oh, come on. I'm struggling with Excel here. If I make that a little more square, I add a trend line to it by right clicking and doing add trend line. You can pretty much not see the line because it is underneath all those dots, which is what we want. Trying to move it out of the way over here so that I can see this other plot. Let's move this plot over here. <clears throat> and I'm not entirely sure why it always starts the thing at zero, but our residuals here are fairly even and then they're fairly square as well. So I would say that this means homogeneity and homoscedasticity, maybe minus these couple little four stragglers over here, but four dots in the span of 200 is not gonna be a big deal. So I would say this data looks pretty good and meets most of the assumptions. Um, from there, what I want to do is copy the final data set. Okay, I'm going to ignore my total score because I don't really want to use that in my analysis. It's just a quick hack to get the assumptions. I'm going to save this as our... Um, final data. And then we're also going to change that to CSV so we can import that into JASP. Okay. Hit save real quick. When it asks me to save this time, I say no because CSVs for some reason it's like weird about saving. Try to get this to make sure it's saved and close that out. <clears throat> yes. I don't like you either today, Excel. <laughs> okay. So uh, from there, we have some more things to talk about here about how many factors and components that we have, um, a lot about simple structure and adequate solutions. So we're going to define these and then work through those as well. Okay, so given these questions, what the heck do they mean? So what uh, we do first is we really decide the number of factors or components, here we're working with factors, that we want to extract and that's the word most people use is extract. But basically is how many factors do I want to run? And there are four criteria for this with the first one probably being one of the most crucial. Okay, so let's walk through those. Theory. So theory is like usually you've designed the scale or the person who's designed the scale has a reason, an idea of the number that they want. So uh, working with a friend of mine, we were trying to make a three factor scale and it just took six tries. <laughs> but she wanted it to be three. So either you made the scale that way or there's previous research. And so you have a, a theory on how many you expect. The Kaiser criterion is an older criteria that people used to use that will still see as part of JASP. Um, and it's not as popular anymore, but the rule used to be to take the number of eigenvalues over one. 
and we'll get to what the hell is an eigenvalue in just a second, the newer rule is to extract the number of eigenvalues over 0.7. So eigenvalues are a representation of the grouping of variants. So I said what we're going to do is take these correlations and just sort of like squish them together into these different groupings. And eigenvalues are a mathematical representation of like the proportion of variants. The confusing part about this is it's not actually a proportion of variants. It's just like the number six. <laughs> and so you also get a number of eigenvalues as in the number of items. So if I have 32 items in our example, we will get 32 eigenvalues. And so what it does is it takes all of the variants and says, well, this is common here. So here's sort of factor one and here's the common variance here and that's factor two. And it sort of squishes the variance up into um, these little clumps until it runs out of variance. And you run out of variance when you run out of items. So it takes communality and combines communality first and then deals with the unique variants. Um, but only a couple of these are going to be big. So we only want to look at the, the how many big ones we have. And big used to be defined as anything over 1 and is now defined as anything over 0.7. Um, but it's a, eigenvalues are kind of a bit of an arbitrary criteria um, and it's not as popular as these next two, which is to use a scree plot. Um, a scree plot, other than having a fun name, um, is a representation of those eigenvalues. And so the um, eigenvalues are plotted on Y and all of them just in descending order across X here. And you're looking up for where it like levels out. And so let me scroll in a little bit here. Is like they, they level out, they start being approximately all the same size at this point. So everything above the cut point here, or sometimes called the point of inflection, is one. One little dot. Over here, there's two dots before it starts to level out. So you're essentially looking for where the bottom of the, the ravine is. The other more popular analysis now, and this is part of JAS, is a parallel analysis. And a parallel analysis will tell you how many of those eigenvalues are greater than chance. So it calculates the eigenvalues for your data, scrambles your data, recalculates the eigenvalues based on a random order of your data, and it tells you how many of them are bigger than a random order of the data. Okay. Parallel analyses are very popular, um, along with scree plots. Theory is still one of the biggest component, one of the biggest like driving things that you will try. What do you do if they disagree? Well, often people will test both models or test the model with less factors because a simpler solution is better. All right, and before we get to this, let's try running that. Okay, so we're gonna try to answer this question right now. How many factors? So I'm gonna open up JASP. And let us open up that final data set we just made. Let's click on factor and we're going to do exploratory factor analysis. So what you're going to do here, and I'm going to kind of move this over. Ooh, I wanted to make this bigger, just this one. Close enough. We're going to take all of our items and move them over to the right because every item gets to start included in the analysis. Okay. Now, before I can go on to looking at parallel analyses and all these other things that are part of um, how many factors should I run, I have to kind of explain this half over here, this rotation half, um, which is actually part of step two. So I'm gonna kind of pause um, to explain what this over here means. And so once we decide how many factors to run, which we'll do in just a second, the second step that you do is called simple structure. And remember the simplest solution is the best solution. And so how do I find the simplest solution? Well, there's one piece that I think is automatic in JASP here 
that you don't have a whole lot of control over, and then a, a couple more. So the first one is the what's called the fitting estimation. And the fitting estimation is literally the math that's happening in the background. Um, and you have, outside of JASP, a couple of choices here. And so I kind of made a table. With EFA, generally the gold standard, the one with the big star on it, is maximum likelihood. Maximum likelihood creates estimates for your data that are the most likely um, estimates. There's also something called alpha factoring. There's principal axis factoring, which is sort of tricky on which column it should go in. Uh, kind of leans more towards PCA. Image factoring and then principal components is also a type of math for principal components analysis. Not to be confusing. <laughs> but I'm fairly sure what JAS picks in the background for you is ML. So we're gonna, it's gonna do that for you automatically, but that is called the fitting estimation. Okay, and that just means the type of math it's using to calculate the estimates. The other thing that we're gonna do is rotation. So what rotation is, is it's, it, it factor analysis is regression on steroids. So it's regressions and re, like multiple, multiple regressions. And so it creates these, these sort of pictures for you of the best fitting data. And the way to fit the data the best is to rotate. So I'm trying to get to the simplest solution. And so I'm going to rotate my regression analyses until I get the best fit. And the best fit here is the most commonality we can describe. And so what rotation does is, is it maximizes the loadings for a, a item on one factor while minimizing the loadings on another factor. And so it allows us to say item one is factor one and not factor two. And so it really, it helps us find the best fit. So you can think about this as like those kids boards with all the different block shapes and you're trying to puzzle piece them together. You rotate those blocks until they fit into the hole. And that's kind of what we're doing with factor analysis is we're rotating our regression equations until they fit the best. And fitting the best means creating the simplest solution by increasing commonality, maximizing loadings in one spot, and minimizing them in the other spot. Now there's two ways to rotate. An orthogonal rotation, so here's an example with two factors, and we're trying to explain the blue dots and the green dots. Orthogonal rotations are forced to rotate at 90 degree angles. So we're, we're keeping the black lines, which are the red is where it's turning, at a very set plus shape. And so you're very restricted at keeping them at 90 degree angles. What that does is it says that the factors are uncorrelated. So by having those two regression equations at that 90 degree angle, it says that factor one and factor two are uncorrelated with each other and they have to rotate in that plus shape. Okay, that is a joke. Um, I, at least in psychology, there's almost nothing that's truly uncorrelated. And so orthogonal rotations are heavily advising against them. Don't do them. Instead, do an oblique rotation. Oblique rotations here allow us to bend those, those lines and um, not require that there be a 90 degree angle here and they tend to fit the data better okay. um, because you're, not, you're allowing factors to be correlated. And factors will often be correlated. Now here's the catch. Orthogonal rotations have no place. There is no need for them because if items are truly uncorrelated, an oblique rotation will give you the same answer. And if you're watching this video and you're gonna take a quiz, you should write that down. That orthogonal rotations in in this research field, unless you've got a really good reason, are useless because oblique rotations will give you the same answer as an orthogonal rotation if factors are truly uncorrelated. If they're not uncorrelated, then it'll give you a simple solution for correlations. There are hypotheses out there in the world that will that assume that these things are uncorrelated, but the truth of data, at least working with participants, is that factors are often correlated. Okay. Otherwise, why are they on the same scale? So um, we pretty much don't want to use orthogonal rotations, but you have to know what they are to understand why you shouldn't use them. Okay. 
So it assumes they're uncorrelated, it rotates at 90 degrees, it means there's no overlap between them, not really suggested. But here are some of the types, Varimax, Quartermax, and Equ Equimax. Before you believe that everything with a max is a simple structure, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> is an orthogonal rotation. Unfortunately, oblique rotations also have the word max in them. So uh, oblique rotations assume there's a correlation, rotates at any degree, allows there to be overlap, and then this right here, highlight, highlight, highlight. Why would we ever do a orthogonal rotation? You shouldn't because this right here. If those factors are truly uncorrelated, we'll get those same results. A couple types, direct oblomen and promax, we're going to use oblomen. That's the one I've had work best. So that's what's going on over here under rotation. So we could pick orthogonal, and then there are a couple of different, there are the main three that I told you about. We're not going to do that though. We're going to leave it as oblique. I'm going to change that from Promax though to Oblomen. And I just have a better, I have better experiences with Oblomen, but Promax is a great rotation as well. So now that I've explained that, let's go back to that question of how many factors. And so what happens automatically in JASP, which is being a little weird here, there it goes, um, is it runs a parallel analysis for you. And so that parallel analysis here, because this is sort of the default settings, says that there should be six factors. And so the only real way that you see that is it just shows you like there are six factors that it's labeled here. So I'm gonna come over here and it says how many factors, and I'm gonna say, okay, our parallel analysis suggests six factors. Theory suggests three factors, or two to three. And that you just have to know. Now, I let's see what quick can I see the other ones? So let's click on here, scree plot, so we can see what our eigenvalues look like. So here's our scree plot. I copy that. Now when I paste this from Excel or from um, JASP, it always makes me do this. I don't know if it does this on Windows, but just click yes. Nefarious scree plots. Right. Can make this a bit smaller so it'll fit here. Okay, so calculate our eigenvalues here. Uh, it showed me some of these actually go negative. And so the, the worst problem I have with these is that you can't, it starts to look like food coloring things, but you can't quite see because the simulated data is overlapping it. And often you look at for where they're crossed, but I can clearly tell there's one, two, three before they level out. So it kind of sometimes can make it hard to read, but here I can tell where they cross and this is becomes level. So there are three factors here. that are um, before it levels out at the bottom. So, so far we have one for six, one sort of two for three. Other thing you can do is um, tell it to base on eigenvalues. So I'm just click eigenvalues here, tell it to give me anything over one and just see how many of them pop up over here. Um, that's the old Kreiser criterion because I can't tell where one is on here. So if I do eigenvalues over one, I actually get 11 factors. Now, six factors is way too many. I have enough items for that, but whew, I'm going to go with three. Um, a three because my theory says two to three and my scree plot says three and I'm a big fan of the scree plots. I also like parallel analysis, but scree plot, look at that. That looks like three to me. Take my word for it. So what to get only three, um, whoa, what are you doing here? Eigenvalues over one. It just had 11 on here. Now it's one. Okay, hold on. Let me click back parallel analysis and let it run. Okay, it's at six. 
I'm going to click here and do eigenvalues above 1. See what happens. Three, okay. So I don't know what happened. That one also says three. So let's go with three. Okay. Now to get a manual number after you make this decision, just click manual so that it always stays on the number that you're actually wanting. Okay. So I've told it to do three. Just kind of let it run its thing in the background. So we're gonna do three of them. How can I achieve simple structure? Well, we've talked about the math and we've talked about the rotation. Let's talk about the other part of that. It's the loadings. So what you see in that table that you're getting are the correlations between the item and the factor. So let me go back real quick. This here, this 4.77 is a correlation between item one and factor one. Um, what we want to look for is things that are over 0.3. So for some reason, the set and JASP is 0.4. So we're going to take that down a notch, but we're going to do 0.3. And that's because um, that the correlation of 0.3 is kind of a medium effect size. And so that's 10% of the variance in that item is due to the factor. We can actually go higher, but you can't really go lower. So you want items to load, this is the term here, on their factor at 0.3 minimum. So let's change that over here. And we're gonna change that highlight to 0.3. Ooh, not 0 0.003, but 0.3. So those numbers are all there, you saw them. What is happening here in the output is that it's only gonna show you the ones above 0.3. And that's handy because it allows us to look at what we would consider for the next part. And so we want each item to load on one and only one factor. So you don't want them to double load, meaning they load on more than one factor, or to not load at all, which means they load on no factor. Okay. This is called simple structure for a reason. We're rotating the data to maximize the loadings on one factor and minimize on the others. So we want it to load on one and only one, unless you got a really good reason for double loading, one and only one. Um, then, once we kind of get items into that shape, remember that each factor should have at least three to four questions. So if factors only end up with one item, you should consider eliminating the factor and going down. So if we're working on this analysis and factor three only has two questions, we should try a two question or two factor scale. And so what do you do if I have bad items? So let's look here. These first couple knowing that by the way order it does them in alphabetical order which is a little annoying but these first couple all load on factor one this one loads on factor two factor one uh, here's a bad one question 15 here loads on both of them so see how it's two of them here in this row that's no good we want to get rid of it okay. so this particular step the simple structure step you might run several times you will run several times unless you get lucky um, what we're going to do is find those bad items and take them out. Uh, cross loadings are where we allow them to load on more than one item. We don't want to do that. So when would I be finished? Well, you take out the items until they all load adequately on one and only one. So let's try it. So we've already said question 15 here is poor because it's loading on more than one. And I'm going to kind of scroll through these until I get through all of them. So 15, 18 is good. These all load on one. This one loads on two, that's question four. Okay. So question four and 15 all only load on one. And then here's one problem over here for factor three. It's only got four items and you can, in a minute you're gonna see why this might be problematic. But to get rid of them, what we do is we come back over here under included variables and just take them out. So take out question four, take out question 15. And then we're going to kind of wait here. I'm going to turn off screen plot just so it doesn't have to do as much wait for my numbers to reappear. 
I'm going to just check again, see what's happened. Now, something happened here. Factor 2 and Factor 3 switched places. So I said, you see, oh, a second ago, there's four of them. That's okay. They will do that. There's no, the ordering to the factor is about the amount of variance accounted for. So um, there's no um, reason they don't, the names of them we'll get to in a minute. It's okay if they move around. All right, so we want each one to load on one and only one. So it's looking pretty good, pretty good. Good, that means we're done. Now you might go through this a second, third, fourth, fifth time until you kind of whittle out the bad questions. Honestly, the more questions you have, the more whittling you end up doing. There was one project that I worked on that we had 55 questions. And I think we went through six rounds because, you know, we took out four and then all of a sudden four more popped up. It was like a game of whack-a-mole of like getting rid of the bad questions as they appeared because four of them were bad together. We took them out and then another three were bad together and we took those out and so uh, it took a while. Uh, most of the examples I have for you guys are not as crazy. This is data from, um, this is real data, uh, just as an example that, of data that I collected from a class, but um, most examples I have I know will at least run for you. So that being said, um, this looks good. Now, once you have this here, what we're actually gonna do is turn that highlight off. Because one of the big things we wanna do when we report this um, analysis is to report all the numbers so people can decide for themselves. So I'm gonna click copy. Um, and I, I wanna include the entire table. The highlight function is really handy to help me see where they're loading but when I report this um, for writing it up, I want the entire table. So what we did here is we removed questions four and 15 for double loading, then simple structure was achieved. And I would paste in this table. Um, and you'll see that I have an example here. Now in my example table, I actually sorted the items and bolded them. But for right now, I really want you guys to just get what the heck is going on. So as long as you have a table with all of the items. All right, I've got this simple structure. Is that any good? So I've created a picture of my data, a model. But is my model any good? So we've been working with p-values all year and there hasn't popped up a p once. <laughs> so what do we use to decide if our model is significant in a sense. And so there's kind of three ways for that. We're gonna talk about fit indices, which are gonna be a total bass backwards sort of thinking from what you've been doing all year, reliability and theory again. So we start and we end with theory. So fit indices are a measure of how well things fit. And when you build models, you want them to fit well. So remember we're trying to put the puzzle pieces in and we want them to fit. We don't want to have the wrong puzzle piece in the right in the wrong spot. And so what that does is it takes the original correlation matrix, it takes our rotated correlation matrix and it just sees how well they match each other. So there's two types of fit indices and there's actually a lot of different fit indices but I'm only gonna explain the ones that you'll see in JASP. There is an alphabet soup of these. There's probably like a hundred plus um, there's probably five that are really big and popular, and we're going to um, use the big two that you're going to get in JASP's output. Um, but goodness of fit statistics, the, the, the range of them, there's 10 or 12, um, we want really large values because it's a goodness of fit. How good does it fit? And so one would be perfect. And it takes that reproduced correlation matrix, the, the rotated one, it takes the real correlation matrix and just looks at how much they match. So it's a correlation between the correlation matrices. Um, and the one that is presented in JASP is the TLI for Tucker-Lewis index. It is also the non-normed fit index. Those are, it's the exact same statistic. It's got two names for funsies. And good, fits are above 0.95, acceptable fits are above 0.9, and poor fits are below 0.9. Okay. 
Let me explain RIMC to you, and then we'll look at those in JASP. The other category of fit indices are residual statistics, and we want really small values. So it takes that reproduced correlation matrix and subtracts the real correlation matrix and looks at, at the residuals. Residuals are just the error. So RIMC is a measure of error. Okay. And so it's the root mean square error of approximation, or RIMC as everybody calls it. Um, and it is a measure of bad variance. So we want this number to be very small. Zero would be perfect. So good is below 0.06, not 0.05. Acceptable is 0.06 to 0.08, and poor is 0.10. So don't ask me what you do if you get 0.09. <laughs> Most of the time people say acceptable is 0.06 to 0.10, but actually the published numbers are what I have all on the screen here. Um, so let's look at those numbers. The way you get that is you click additional fit indices. It's going to give you a chi-square, totally useless value. Nobody looks at it. Um, and then here's our fit indices. So it gives me RIMC and the confidence interval for RIMC. So it's just barely in the, I guess, acceptable range. But our confidence interval does not go into poor, so that's good. Then it gives me TLI, which is definitely in the not acceptable range. And this happens a lot where your fit indices don't match. So RIMC says it's okay, you know, eh, it's okay. TLI says, no, this isn't okay. So what do I do if my structure is simple, but my fit indices are bad? And this is where you might try a two-factor solution. You might try a six-factor solution. So you can try several different models and pick the one that you think explains the data the best. I won't bore you with doing that here, um, but that would be what I might try. I would also look at the items, individual items, and see if maybe some of them are kind of wonky. Um, I will note something I actually meant to say a minute ago. Let's look again at where items are loading. Check out factor two here. Factor two is questions 17, 27, 6, and 9. That's all of our reverse coded items. Reverse coded items, I don't have strong enough words for how I feel about them. They never do what you want them to do. People want them to be a good measure of people paying attention and they want them to be a good measure of um, the sort of opposite or, or like I'm getting at this construct the another direction. But in reality, they often tend to be complete bullshit. They don't tend to work well with their neighbors and they tend to do this where they, uh, and I have a lot of strong adjectives for this lecture and it's not on purpose. Uh, I just have very big feelings about scale development. Um, they tend to be, they do their own thing. They're the hippie kids. I don't want to go with the rest of them. Um, so for me, how would I make this model better? I would try actually taking these four out and making a two-factor model and seeing if that works. Because I bet these four doing their own thing is causing a bit of a, a bit of a struggle. And it's not necessarily that these four um, are theoretically related. It might just be because they're negative. They're all reverse coded, meaning they're negatively worded. And that's not what you're trying to measure. You're not trying to measure the fact that they picked up on um, the knots in the sentence. You're trying to measure the latent construct. So my small rant about reverse coded items. Um, so, you know, solutions like eh, eh, eh. So our RIMC says it's okay. TLI says not good. And you would report those um, exact numbers. Let's try reliability. See what happens. So reliability is a measure of how well the items hang together. So for each factor, it's sort of a measure of how well they fit together on that factor. Chromebox Alpha is the most common. I've seen 0.7 and 0.8 as both acceptable numbers. So take your pick. And sometimes people will do split half reliability as well, where they'll split a data set in half, run the reliability, and see if those two data, if those two um, are similar. Right. Um, interpreting Chromebox Alpha, so Klein is a reference for 0.7. But in general, if you have more items, you tend to have a bigger alpha. 
because the more items you use to measure something, the more liable it tends to be. You should treat each subscale sub -scale separately. And be sure those reverse coded items are already reverse coded. Okay. So let's do that here. So I'm going to run reliability for each factor and I have to kind of write down which factor goes with which. So I'm going to copy this partial table with the caveat that you should not report said partial table. We're just going to use it temporarily to come up with our factor list and also so I don't have to pop back and forth between screens. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to say, okay, these four go together. So we've got down here, um, questions one, 10, oh, stop 10, 11, 12. Questions 14, 16, 18, 20 through 25. Okay. Okay. 29 and 3. So one thing I don't like about this is the way that it orders them. Uh, 31 and 32, 7 and 8. So what I've done here is pull all of the items that are loaded under factor 1. And when I mean loaded under factor 1, they're the like, that's where they're shining the strongest, they're above 0.3. Our reverse coded factor 2 here is questions 6, 9, 17, and 27. And then everything else is factor three. So we've got 13, 9, 19, 2, 26, 28, 30. And five. So that doesn't include our two bad items. So you see that four is not on our list anymore. We're going to take that and plug that into JASP here by clicking on descriptives, reliability analysis. And so that's why I said I kind of I needed to write them down um, so I could see them at the same time. So I'm kind of dual screen here. So I've got one, three, seven, eight, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty through twenty five. Twenty nine, thirty one, and thirty two. So we'll get Chromebox Alpha. We'll also ask for the mean and standard deviation so we can report those. Um, and then uh, one thing, oh, it actually will let you reverse code items here as part of Chromebox Alpha, but we needed to do that before EFA anyway. So uh, I would use this for item one, but if I was trying to suss out a bad item, you could also do Alpha as dropped. So alpha if dropped is if I dropped this item, how well would my fit or my um, reliability be? And so if one of these is um, really high and the rest of them are really low, it implies that the item is bad. But mostly we just want to um, look here at this reliability analysis. So I'm gonna copy this one. This is for factor one. Um, and that says that the average score for that item is um, five points, the standard deviation is one point, and the Chromebox Alpha is really good. So factor one has a good reliability. Click OK. I'm going to click reliability analysis again to get a second one here. Sorry, it's popped down. I'm going to tell all these to go back. I'm going to do my second factor, which is all my reverse coded items. So reliability for this one's much lower. 
much. It's it's still acceptable, right? Um, but the average score on that item is is a lot, it's pretty high. So it's six points out of a seven point scale. And then let's do the last one here. The only reason I'm hitting OK is so I get a different box over here, so it's in two two separate boxes. So we've got 2, 5, 13, 19, 26, 28, and 30. Okay. And that reliability is the lowest, but all still acceptable. So our fit is like, eh, it's okay, but our reliabilities are good. Okay. The very last thing that you do is you think about theory. So you start with theory and you end with theory. And do these questions make any sense? So instead of calling them factor one, factor two, and factor three, we're gonna give them names. And those names are something you make up. People will struggle with this part, um, but when it's your own research, you're like, I am looking for intrinsic motivation. And so you would have questions that you think assess extrinsic motivation. And so when your questions um, end up in the wrong column, that's where it starts to not make sense. And so you can actually at this step go, you know what, that question was not supposed to load on factor one. It should have loaded on factor two, so I'm gonna take it out. And we did this on one of my friend's papers um, that we got published because she had questions that she expected to load under fight or flight or um, freeze categories. And so some of the fight questions loaded in the wrong place. And so we just deleted the question altogether um, as a way of getting them to not be in the wrong category. Okay, so we just took that puzzle piece out. And what you'll end up doing to look at that um, is, and I'm gonna close PowerPoint here, 800 windows open, let's look at that scale and then look at the items. Oops, ran it off the screen over here. So, trying to put as much on one screen as possible. <laughs> We've got one, three, seven, eight, ten, eleven. 10, 11. So let's look over here. One, I experience pleasure and satisfaction to show others I can succeed. Eight for the intense experience, feeling I experience. 10, because going to college makes me important. 11, it helps me learn about subjects that are important. I can continue to learn. So you should be getting a pattern here, satisfaction for the pleasure I get, um, for the pleasure I experience. So um, 20, to show myself I'm an intelligent person for the pleasure because it's meaningful, it's ex personal satisfaction. So all of these are very intrinsic motivation categories. This is about my own personal enjoyment and um, growth. And so factor one, we could label as growth or intrinsic motivation or satis internal satisfaction. So I could give that several different names. We've already talked about the problems with six, nine, 17, and 27 as sort of the unhappiness variable. So let's look at that last one. Two, I need a degree, five, college, better understanding of the profession, 13, complete my degree, 19, prerequisite for my job, 26, responsibility for my career, 28, career, 30, career. So I would say these are external motivations or um, career goal orientations. So the other one is internal orientations, the other one external or orientations. Um, and so that I would label those factors as names. And those seem to fit together. So our fit indices are kind of poor, but reliability is good, I got simple structure, and they seem to make sense together. So I might try to present this to people and say, we should see you know, what we could do in the future to maybe get a better fitting model. All right, so all that, all of this new terms and craziness and not one p-value is how we do factor analysis. Now the write-ups for these do get a little bit longer because you tend to have to explain all of the different rounds that you've gone through. And then just walking through each one of those steps. So walk through, how did you decide on the number of questions? How did you decide on simple structure? And did the model fit uh, well at all? And then what people report in table format is the loadings for the final model. 
all of the numbers, not just the uh, strong numbers. So all that together is EFA in JASP.